rootwithrise.net is a support community where you can make what you want out of it. Um, you can find people to connect to. You can find articles and information that you might not be able to find just through word of mouth if you're talking to your doctor. You can find perspective pieces. Um, you can find tips and tricks to managing things like difficulty sleeping, which affects a lot of us with RA. Um, I think it's allowed me to reach more people than I would have otherwise and to to share my story, particularly on topics that don't get talked about very often, that I think, like, I write about the things that I would have wanted to find as, as a newly diagnosed patient. And so now I have a platform to write about those things and hopefully people can find it and read about them and feel not as alone as I did. Um, I would describe rheumatoid arthritis.net as a hug. It's one of those warm, supportive hugs you get when you looking for a little help and a little reassurance. We would like to welcome you to the 7th Abu Dhabi Advanced Rheumatology Review Course. Now on its 7th year, ADARC has grown year on year since its inception in 2011 and has become a one-stop shop for practitioners of rheumatology and related fields. ADARC brings together up to 20 of the unmissable world's leading published experts in adult and pediatric rheumatology to share their latest insights, research findings and case studies through an intensive series of lectures and workshops. It is also a unique networking opportunity for delegates to interact, exchange expert opinions, and discuss key questions important to clinical practice with key leaders in the field. Catch up with old colleagues, learn about the latest developments with our industry partners, and gain new insights through our highly informative exchange of scientific and clinical information. Register now to ADARC 2017 from the 21st to the 23rd of October 2017.
Hello, my name is Hans Belsma. I'm a professor of rheumatology in Utrecht, the Netherlands, and also the president-elect of the EULA organization. And I would like to tell you a little bit about our EULA organization, because EULA is an umbrella organization of 45 European countries, encompassing not only all the scientific and doctors' uh, organizations of rheumatology in those countries, but also the health professionals, and very important, we also have 35 different countries sending patients to our organization. So we have a very strong patient part in the EULA organization and we're very proud of that. And we use that in, in many ways and an important way to use it is uh, in making recommendations. Because if you make recommendations for chronic diseases, it's not only important to see all the evidence-based uh, doctor's point of view, but also the patient point of view. So the recommendations from the EULA are characterized and are a bit different from, for instance, the American uh, recommendations because we have a very strong patient input making the things most relevant for them. So what I'm going to talk about at this uh, interesting Abu Dhabi uh, review course is a little bit about what we discussed at the Euro Congress in London, emphasizing recommendations but also emphasizing all those things that are relevant from the field of basic and translational science that may have influence in the coming years and those things that are early trials showing some first evidence that things are working to help our patients. My name is Shakib Sokolovic. I'm professor of internal medicine and rheumatology and I'm also a cardiologist, you know. So my I'm uh, coming from Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and I work in University Clinical Center and Medical Faculty of Sarajevo uh, as Deputy Head of uh, Cardiology Clinic and Rheumatology. Uh, I came here for the conference, I was invited for the conference to provide a workshop on capillaroscopy, it's hands-on training. So I had two sessions, morning and afternoon session, uh, providing to the delegates uh, who signed to, to, uh, to learn about capillaroscopy. Capillaroscopy is a diagnostic tool, machine, non-invasive, that you look at the capillaries. These capillaries, they are micro vault. Micro capillary vault is the first pathological site of many, many diseases. So we, we use this ca capillaroscopy uh, diagnostic tool uh, in uh, many diseases, like distinguishing primary reno from secondary reno. Reno phenomena is when somebody, especially young girls, they have a, a blue hands, exposing them to the cold, to the stress. So we can, but this can be also the, the secondary to the secondary uh, systemic sclerosis disease, like scleroderma, uh, in the pulmonary hypertension, in dermatomyositis. Uh, we use this tool, uh, diagnostic tool, in a uh, uh, polymyositis, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, and we can also predict digital ulcers uh, as the final consequence of disease. But also we can use in cardiology, in arterial hypertension, in diabetes, in atherosclerosis, and we can also link the changes in uh, capillaries linked to the coronary slow flow phenomena. So if you find some small changes in the capillary loop, with the patient without any heart symptoms, we can detect some pathological change in the coronaries. For what is the, uh, important for the patients for this uh, diagnostic tool is uh, because it provides a real picture of the uh, endothelial function and the capillary function in the hands and feet, in the whole body, and we can uh, use it for diagnosis. For example, if the patient has reno, if it has capillary, some pathological changes, and if it uh, has an autoimmunity test, positive, ANA positive, we can predict this patient will develop in the near future, in the next two years, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. So we can also use this for therapy monitoring. So if we uh, follow up the patients after three months, and then we can detect some minor changes, so we can say, well, our therapy works, our, our therapy doesn't work, so we have to change it. So this is a, patient can be asymptomatic, but the pathological changes can occur and can develop more in the capillary world. So this is a very important uh, 
diagnostic test that we can use for our patients. So in summary, psoriatic arthritis is a heterogeneous disease uh, with a lot of challenges, both for diagnosis, assessment and, and treatment. But we have seen a lot of uh, progress the last years, which will benefit the patients both for diagnosis, assessment and treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. So my name is Peter Taylor, I'm Professor of Musculoskeletal Sciences at the University of Oxford. So I've given a talk about biologics and biosimilars, and biologics are protein-based drugs that specifically target one aspect of the immune system that in some way has gone wrong in inflammatory arthritis and is responsible for much of the damage, the pain, swelling and inflammation uh, that causes so many symptoms in diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. So patients suffer from pain, from joint swelling and joint stiffness in particular. This condition certainly can be treated and the important message really for patients or people who have swelling and pain in their joints is to uh, get referred to a specialist as early as possible because the earlier that there's intervention with effective treatment, the better the outcomes and indeed these days people can do very well indeed. There are simple treatments which involve uh, tablet style treatments. Some of these tablets are only taken once a week but in patients who need rather more powerful treatment, we have a variety of injectable therapies which are extremely effective at relieving many of the symptoms, but also at preventing damage to joints. And so this is a preventative approach as well as helping patients to feel better on a day-to-day -day basis. So my name is Chris Denton, I'm a professor at the Royal Free Hospital in London University College Medical School and uh, we specialise in a rare rheumatic disease called scleroderma or systemic sclerosis and this is the topic of my lecture at this conference. Scleroderma is an uncommon disease, it affects around 1 in 10,000 people but it can be very severe. Unfortunately a lot of patients still die from scleroderma and they die because they develop problems in the internal organs. Scleroderma means hard skin which means that patients develop inflammation and fibrosis in the skin which limits their movement and can affect the hands and function. But as well as affecting the outside structures some patients develop similar changes in the internal organs especially in the lungs and the heart and the kidneys. These complications cause a range of problems and can ultimately lead to uh, life-threatening uh, imp impact on these, um, on these structures. So being rare, many, pa many doctors have not seen many cases of scleroderma and, and many patients, when they first develop the symptoms, are unaware of what the, they might mean. Most patients with scleroderma first develop a problem called Raynaud's phenomenon where they get cold in the extremities and poor blood flow to the hands and to the feet. They may then develop some symptoms of indigestion reflecting involvement of the gut. At this stage they often consult their doctor and a diagnosis can be made if they have the right investigations. These tests include blood workup that looks for autoantibodies which can be very specific. These blood tests allow you to suspect scleroderma and then move on to see the appropriate specialists. And it is important that a scleroderma patient sees a specialist, a rheumatologist or another doctor who understands the condition. Because once the diagnosis is made they then need to have tests to check the heart, the lungs, the kidney and the other internal organs so that they can go on to treatment. Fortunately, although there's no cure for scleroderma, there are emerging treatments, and this was something I was able to highlight in my lecture. There are treatments now that can improve the skin, that can start to improve the lung, and can treat the very severe complications of pulmonary hypertension and of scleroderma renal crisis. Renal crisis in particular is an condition, a complication that now has a much lower impact on the disease than in the past. So all in all, 
although it's still a very challenging disease, there are uh, signs now that, as with other areas of rheumatology, there are advances and we're doing studies that are showing benefit of treatments. And so I hope over the next few years we'll see further improvements. Hello, in this video we're going to look at rheumatoid arthritis, which is a systemic um, rheumatological disorder affecting multiple joints. The clinical presentation of rheumatoid arthritis is arthritis which is symmetrical. We have pain, swelling, as well as nodules around the area. Hand involvement is early in the disease and affects the metacarpophalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints. In rheumatoid arthritis, there's also extra articular involvement, which we will look at later on. But first, let us look at the hand involvement in, in rheumatoid arthritis and see how it differs to osteoarthritis. So here is rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. So in osteoarthritis, the joints affected are the distal interphalangeal joints as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints. Whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, it is the proximal interphalangeal joints and the metacarpophalangeal joints. As well, you can have other um, joint involvement, such as the wrist. So, so these joints are affected early in the disease in rheumatoid arthritis. But as the disease progresses, you can have other features occurring in the hands. These are swan neck, boutonniere, or Z deformity of the thumb. So in swan neck, what you have is you have the distal interphalangeal joints flexed, but the proximal interphalangeal joints hyperextended. In boutonniere, it's the opposite. You have the distal interphalangeal joints hyperextended and the proximal interphalangeal joints flexed. The Z deformity of the thumb is essentially the thumb looking like a Z. It's, it's sort of bent, hyperextended. In the hands, the hands can also deviate medially. This is referred to as ulnar deviation. So they were the, they were the, uh, the hand, what, what were the features of the hands in rheumatoid arthritis. Let us actually look at what happens inside the joints. So let us zoom into the, this, a finger here. And just to recap the anatomy, here we have the bone, the joint capsule, the synovial membrane, also known as a synovium. The synovial membrane, also known as a synovium, which produces the synovial fluid, which helps in lubrication, um, as well as supplying nutrients to the area. Then we have the cartilage here in blue. In rheumatoid arthritis, you essentially have inflammation of the synovium, of the synovial membrane. You have a synovitis, and this causes pain and swelling, um, which occurs in rheumatoid arthritis. This also leads to bone and cartilage erosion, breakdown. Another feature we can see in the joints of um, rheumatoid arthri arthritic patients is angiogenesis. So that was the macroscopic view of the joint, just an overview. Let's look at it in a, more de in a lot more detail at a cellular level. Let us zoom into this area and um, see what cells are involved. So just to... Uh, just to show where we are, here we have the bone, the synovium, here is the fluid here in yellow, and blue is the cartilage. And again, I'm drawing the synovium really big because it is inflamed, right? The synovial membrane. 
Now, the synovial membrane is made up of these cells known as fibro, uh, fibroblast-like synoviocytes. And these guys are very important in the pathogenesis of um, rheumatoid arthritis. So again, rheumatoid arthritis is where we have inflammation of the synovial membrane, of the synovium. Now, the exact trigger of the, the inflammation of the disease is really not quite, un, not quite known. However, we are now looking at what cells we can find here and what cells are involved. So we have macrophages here, and they're, they're normally around here as well. But they, they essentially begin secreting cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6, which, of course, leads to inflammation. The cytokines also stimulate the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. When the fibroblast-like synoviocytes are stimulated, they, they essentially become activated, and then they begin to proliferate. At the same time, they also begin uh, assisting in the rank L expression, stimulating the rank L expression, which together with the cytokines here will stimulate osteoclast activity, which will lead to bone erosion, what we find in rheumatoid arthritis. When the fibroblast-like synoviocytes are stimulated and proliferate, they also begin secreting proteases. These proteases essentially cause the cartilage to break down. So we get cartilage degradation. And the cartilage also secrete proteases, and it's sort of like a feedback loop. Another interesting feature of, when, of the fibroblast-like synoviocytes is that when it's stimulated, when it's activated, these guys can actually migrate from joint to joint. So they can migrate from the hand joint on one side to the hand joint on the other. And this is why we get symmetrical arthritis in rheumatoid arthritis. We also can find T cells in the area, in the synovium. T cells make up about 50% of the uh, immune cells in this area, so they're very important in the pathophysiology. T cells uh, promote inflammation, essentially, and they, secrete, they can secrete interleukin-17, which will promote macrophage activity as well as stimulate the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. The T cells also help um, in the expression of rank L, which will stimulate osteoclast for bone erosion. We also find plasma cells in the area, and plasma cells only make up a small majority, about 5% of the immune cells, and they essentially assist in, in inflammation through cytokines as well as through antibodies. Now, in the fluid, in the synovial fluid, not in the synovial membrane, in the synovial fluid, we can find neutrophils. And neutrophils, they, they essentially produce proteases and reactive oxygen species, which will essentially cause bone and cartilage degradation, erosion. So they contribute to inflammation. In the synovial fluid, we also find the immune complexes, which is a feature of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These immune complexes are essentially antibodies that bind to one another, and they essentially promote inflammation. So those are the cells that we can find um, in an inflamed um, joint in rheumatoid arthritis. Again, another feature around this area is that we see angiogenesis. Also, the cytokines that are produced by all these cells, they help um, increase vascular permeability and um, the expression of adhesion molecules on the vascular vasculature, allowing for these immune cells to migrate um, into the joints. But where do all these cells come from? Why do they migrate into these joints and cause rheumatoid arthritis? Well, as I mentioned, we don't actually know, but there are a few theories out there. So let's go to the pre-rheumatoid arthritis phase before a person has rheumatoid arthritis. And there are many uh, possible things that could contribute to the development of rheumatoid arthritis. These include genetics, epigenetic modifications, smoking, a bacteria called Porphyromonas gingivalis, which can lead to gingivitis. Essentially, these things, they can cause modification of autoantigens. What do I mean by modifications of autoantigens? It essentially, what I essentially mean is modification of your own antigens um, to make it seem foreign to the immune cells. So you're modifying your... So these things can lead to modifications of your own antigens leading um, to an immune response. And the modifications of 
autoantigens include what's known as citrullination. So not only this, things can occur in the joints, such as you can have a synovial injury or hyperplasia, or you can have infection within the joint. And this will trigger you know, cytokine release and it will cause inflammation. This inflammation that occurs in the joints can also lead to modification of autoantigens, so modification of your own antigens, making it seem foreign. And this also includes citrullination. So because you have modifications of your own antigens, this will be recognized by antigen-presenting cells, and it will essentially activate the antigen-presenting cells to initiate an immune response. The antigen-presenting cell will migrate to the lymph nodes, where, here I'm drawing the lymph node. Remember, the lymph node here is green, and within the lymph node we have the germinal center, where we have B cells. Anyway, the antigen-presenting cell will activate T cells here in the area, so we can have a CD4 T cell activation. And when the, CD4, uh, when the T cell is activated, the CD4 T cell, it can activate then B cells in the germinal center. And this can be through co-stimulation. When the B cells are activated, they will begin to, you know, proliferate. They will begin to class switch. And they will become plasma cells. Then plasma cells will then produce autoantibodies. They will produce the antibodies against your own antigen, essentially. So then what? Well, you have now CD4 T helper cells, and then you have the uh, antibodies and the plasma cells, and they will also have homing receptors and stuff like that, which will allow them to migrate to joint tissue. So that is how they move into the joints in rheumatoid arthritis. So I hope that made sense. Now, it's important to talk about the antibodies because they're an important feature in rheumatoid arthritis. We have two main antibodies found, um, and these are, we look at one, one, one of them at a time. So the first one is the rheumatoid factor, which is an IgM antibody, and it's present in 75% of people with rheumatoid arthritis. What these guys do is that they target FC portion of IgG antibodies, so the constant region. And they essentially are the ones that, are, that, that, in, that form the immune complex and can deposit in the synovial fluid. The rheumatoid factor not only you know, um, forms immune complexes with, but, with itself, but with the IgG as well as complement proteins. So it will promote inflammation. The second antibody is the anti-citrullinated uh, protein antibody. Now these guys, as the name suggests, they target citrullinated proteins. Um, these are things such as fibrin and filigrin. Now, they target citrullinated proteins. What are they? Well, citrullinated proteins are essentially proteins um, who have arginine residues that have been converted to citrullinate. And this sort of change deems, makes it seem foreign to the body, and that is why uh, when we have modifications of our autoantigens, such as citrullination, our body thinks it's foreign. And unfortunately, in our joints, um, we have these sort of tissues. So therefore, um, that's, how it con so that's how this antibody contributes to the pathophysiology. Um, but essentially, these, these rheumatoid factor and anti-citrullinated protein antibodies, they're important for, in helping diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. Not everyone has rheumatoid factor, but the anti-citrullinated protein antibody, it is a lot more specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So I hope that all made sense. Now, it's important that we talk about the extra-articular involvement uh, within rheumatoid arthritis. So what I'm talking about is involvement of other organs around the body and how rheumatoid arthritis causes problems there too. So these extra-articular involvement is a result of the cytokines produced within the joints and stuff. And these are mainly TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. So within the blood, we have increase in inflammatory cytokines. And they essentially contribute to many things around the body. For example, in the skin, they contribute to the nodule formation. 
in the liver, the, because of the cytokines, the liver will begin um, producing more CRP or ECR proteins, which are inflammatory markers, as well as the liver will produce a lot more hepcidin, which will uh, contribute to anemia in rheumatoid arthritis. Cardiovascular involvement. Well, these cytokines and this inflammation that's occurring will actually promote um, arthrogenesis, so plaque formation. And it can also lead to uh, promote you know, myocardial infarction as well as stroke. Neurological involvement include uh, fatigue um, and depression. And these can be attributed to anemia. Um, bone involvement is very serious in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, sorry, musculoskeletal involvement. So these, these include osteopenia, which can lead to osteoporosis. Um, in the muscles, the infl inflammation causes, uh, can lead to insulin resistance, which, uh, which can result in muscle weakness. Um, and also bone marrow involvement. We can have thrombocytosis, which is a lot of platelet, which can contribute to, you know, to the, plaque from a, uh, the thromb thrombus formation, as well as we have anemia. So I hope that made sense, and I hope you enjoyed this video. We look. So those are the extra articular involvement of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. You also have lung involvement, um, such as pleural effusion and lung infection. But this can be attributed to the treatment used for rheumatoid arthritis, which involves glucocorticoids. And as we know, glucocorticoids suppresses the immune system. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. We looked at the clinical manifestations, the hand involvement, the pathophysiology, uh, the causes, potential causes, as well as the articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you for watching. Bye. Gout is a chronic crystal deposition disease that is the most common inflammatory arthritis. Prevalence of gout is rising. This is potentially due to trends such as increasing age, obesity, and lifestyle factors. In most patients, gout is caused by inefficient renal excretion of uric acid. Decreased excretion of uric acid leads to hyperuricemia, or elevated uric acid levels in the blood, causing urate crystal deposition in the joints, organs, and other connective tissues. Gout, gout and hyperuricemia are independent risk factors for hypertension, CVD, CKD, and diabetes and have been linked to obesity and osteoarthritis. In humans, uric acid is the natural end product of purine metabolism. The production of uric acid comes from two sources, the degradation of purines during normal cellular metabolism and the breakdown of dietary purines in the gastrointestinal tract. Most uric acid produced by the body is eliminated by the kidneys and the remainder is eliminated by the gastrointestinal tract. Within the kidney, the glomerulus filters the blood. The resulting filtrate passes through the proximal tubule where over 90% of uric acid is reabsorbed back into the blood. Multiple transporters, including urat-1 and ot 4 in the renal tubule system are involved in uric acid reabsorption. Urat-1 is one of the major transporters in the renal proximal tubules and reabsorbs most of the filtered uric acid from the lumen, thus maintaining overall uric acid homeostasis. In humans, uric acid levels are regulated by a balance between uric acid production and elimination. In most patients with gout, hyperuricemia results from inefficient renal excretion that may be due to alterations in transporter function. Alterations in transporter function results in higher serum uric acid levels in gout patients. When, when uric acid levels rise above the serum solubility limit, Monosodium urate crystallizes out of the serum and deposits in joints and soft tissues. These crystals, or microtophi, may not be readily visible without special imaging. These crystals can continue to build up for years. Eventually and without warning, an immunogenic event occurs, triggering a powerful inflammatory response. The patient experiences an acute flare of gout. Acute gout flares can be caused by many factors including joint trauma, dehydration, and fluctuations in serum uric acid levels. Acute gout flares can last several days and usually resolve spontaneously. Without urate lowering therapy, continued deposition of monosodium urate crystals may lead to visible tophus formation. Crystals in and around bony surfaces can perpetuate the inflammatory response and cause permanent bone and joint damage. Management of acute gout includes drugs to suppress inflammation, reduce pain, and hasten recovery time.
Following an acute attack, the likelihood of recurrence is high, up to 60% in the first year. Patients that experience frequent recurring flares may require urate-lowering therapy to protect against recurrent episodes and prevent the development of TOFI, which can lead to chronic destructive arthritis. Gout is usually treated through a combination of pharmacological or non-pharmacological means, including caloric restriction, reduced alcohol consumption, and dietary modifications. Long-term pharmacological management of progressive or recurrent gout aims to reduce serum uric acid levels to less than 6 mg per deciliter, or in some cases to less than 5 mg per deciliter. Unless serum uric acid levels are lowered below the saturation point of monosodium urate, crystal deposition may continue. Maintaining low serum uric acid levels prevents crystal formation and deposition and promotes crystal dissolution.